Tomorrow marks the 90th commemoration or anniversary of the Armenian Genocide from April 24, 1915 to April 24, 2005. The Armenians living in Western Armenia were uh, gathered, deported, and in many cases uh, massacred, killed. Maybe a little sad that this. My grandfather passed away in September 1997. The video that we're going to be, that I'm going to be watching, is a film that was taken, or his oral testimony was taken in 1984, and he would have been in his 80s. I never felt ready to see the video because uh, of the loss. Losing my grandfather was still quite raw. He was someone that I felt very close to. Um, and I know that there's, there's a lot of anger probably in what he has to present because he lost his brother and he lost his father and there, there were a family of, of several children. But he also saw that the killings of other members within his uh, village in Kayseri and I think that what I'm going to see is a lot of uh, anger that he was never really able to work through and see resolved. And in some ways, I share that, but I try to set it aside and I try to have my own focus be productive rather than focusing on anger. These kinds of stories that we have from, from all diasporans um, are, are common stories within the community. There's no way of imagining that uh, all of these people, you know, all, their, all of our forefathers conspire to come up with the same story, that they're, all their stories are somewhat unique and all of their histories are unique. So this is a picture, this is your grandmother right here? Yes, yes. Not grandmother, this is his my, mother. Oh, your my mother. Mother. My oh, sorry, it was your mother who was an mother. orphan. So you didn't know your grandmother then, no. or grandfather she, she didn't from your either. mother's side? She didn't know either, because she ended up in orphanage uh, at the at, uh, age of two. She was in 85 when she died. Still, she was looking for her parents. One of the things that we speak very little in Ar about, in, in Ar about the Armenian genocide is the orphans of Armenian genocide. There was thousands and thousands and thousands of Armenian, Armenian orphans because they, it happened so suddenly that the, uh, there was a special effort to take the Armenian children and to, and convert, to convert them, them to Islam and, and to raise and them as, as, Turks. as Turks. The psychology of being orphan kind of she transferred to us as a, a second generation of the survivals and it's, it's very hard. How could a nation rob another people of its wealth, of its historic land, of its life, and get away with it? Well, if you, How could this if you murder either? someone, one person, you know, you go to jail for 25 life, years yes. to life. Uh -huh. uh, here you murder an entire nation and nothing's happened. Denial, denial kind of a second genocide for us. Con yes. it, that continued. The genocide is continued by denying. That that's all Armenians. They feel that way. I think once once they accept that kind of Armenians, they will be able kind of to relieve, and uh, will probably uh, not forget, but probably they will forgive. Mm -hmm. The root causes of the Armenian genocide are very complicated. Uh, the first cause 
was the anxiety and fear which young Turkish reformers felt as they watched the Ottoman Empire crumble around their heads. Consequently, they thought that they were acting out of the highest motives to protect the Turkish heartland against uh, subversive Armenians. The only problem with that was that the Armenians were not particularly subversive. They were a Christian minority within a Muslim land, but uh, by and large, they got along reasonably well with their Muslim neighbors. Uh, it was this highly nationalistic and increasingly xenophobic group of Committee of Union and Progress Turkish nationalists who decided to simply eliminate the Armenians uh, and by eliminating them to eliminate the threat of Western intervention and Russian intervention in domestic Turkish affairs. There is a lot to be proud of when we say we're Armenian. On the other hand, there is this uh, aspect of our history that, has, that is un unrequited, uh, un undealt with, um, and, and that it, it needs dealing with. It's like an open uh, wound or a sore that, that hasn't been given the chance to heal. think that what happened was that the government of Turkey sent out an official order for the deportation of the Armenians in 1915. That order said that the Armenians were traitors or potential traitors and therefore they had to be sent by convoys into the more remote regions of the Ottoman, the old Ottoman Empire or Turkey. But secret orders went out at the same time from the Committee of Union and Progress to its offices all around Turkey, saying on these deportation treks, the Armenians had to be killed, and we are providing killers who will come to your area, and region by region, people released from prison uh, on condition that they participate in these killings, which show up, uh, they were, uh, presented as partisans or as guerrillas fighting for the government uh, during the war, but they were actually bands of organized killers who went from area to area facilitating the murder of the Armenians uh, on these convoy trips. This gentleman's uh, father passed away two days ago. He was alive during the genocide, and they say he comes from the Turkish village of Mox. They, they left that village and uh, went to uh, Iran for a couple of years, and then from Iran they uh, came to, um, uh, to Armenia, to this village. And so they've been in this village since about 1918, 1920. Antana bez hayutuna ais shirchanin gam hayastani mej deryagen mej yeherni masin batmutuna. You guys making cheng matatsum? Yes, of course, of course. You guys making cheng matatsum? Artu karta samanyan hayutuna deryaga yeherni masin teche. Me kavili shat bangi. What's interesting about international recognition of the Turkish Committee of Union and Progress organized murder of the Armenian people is the fact that everybody knew this was different. They didn't have a name for it. 
Uh, they knew it was different than the earlier massacres they'd suffered in the 1870s and 1890s because it was nationwide, it was total or massive, and it was sustained over many, many, over a year at least. But Raphael Lemkin did not uh, give us the concept of genocide as such until a book he published in 1944. One of the sources for his inspiration was his knowledge of the history of the Armenian Genocide. I think that every human group possesses the capacity to commit genocide under the right conditions. If you've suffered a genocide or massacres over a long period of time, there will always be people among your own people who argue that we have to rely exclusively on ourselves, the bonds of solidarity that link us to other people are not significant or substantial and everybody is against us and therefore we should only do what's in our own interest and ignore everybody else and ignore any criticism of what we do by anybody else. So that can happen among any human group. At the Sardarabad Museum, I met uh, Vrej Piloyan, who's the assistant director. The uh, Sardarabad monument is obviously historically very important because it was one of the last battles that uh, Armenians fought with Turkey, and it was really against the regular Ottoman army and the civilian population. Uh, really trying to protect its borders from invasion by the Turks. After I met Vrej Piloyan, he took us down to the village of Nor Gaiseri, which is New Gaiseri. It's basically the village that was founded in memory of uh, those who survived from Gaiseri. And the mayor there was a very nice lady. And she explained that it was the genocide survivors who contributed uh, funds so that, that that village could be raised. And then she invited me to her house and her family had sacrificed basically a lamb. It was really a moving experience to have been part of a reborn uh, Gaiseria. <laughs>
Part of uh, Ms. Savaslian's, Professor Savaslian's work has been to recite and translate these Armenian and Turkish songs, and they talk about basically the massacres. This is part of genocide immediately during the genocide folklore that developed uh, among the uh, specific communities and villages in Western Armenia. She's done all of her research and uh, all of her work here, but she's also traveled abroad and interviewed hundreds of survivors and has obtained their oral uh, testimony. 600, 660 survivors. Does Armenia have a post-recognition scenario? For the state, uh, as far as our foreign policy is concerned, it's the genocide recognition that uh, you know sits uh, high in our foreign policy agenda. Genocide recognition is a moral issue, it's a political issue, it's a historical issue. It will be pursued by the government and the people of Armenia, but it will not and is not be a precondition for normalizing our relations with our neighbor, Turkey. Genocide will be with us as long as we have extreme differences in wealth, opportunity, and in all the good things of life among the people on this earth. The seedbeds of genocide are mass poverty, unemployment, environmental destruction, the kind of problems that we all recognize will take centuries to fix. So until we fix those problems, there will be Rwandas, there will be Sudan, there will be Holocausts, there will be Armenian genocides, there will be Cambodias, etc. There's never been an inevitable genocide. All genocides are preventable. Tonight we're going to be attending a multi-denominational 
multi-ecumenical service in St. Joseph's Oratory, marking the 90th uh, anniversary of the genocide. It's an occasion in part sad and, and in part joyous, and, and the sad part is obvious, but why, why joyous? Well, the point is the joyous aspect of the occasion is the fact that here we are, we've survived, we are beyond surviving, we are prospering. It is a tribute to history that we have among us this evening witnesses and survivors of the genocide against Armenians from 90 years ago in 1915.